Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Trader Summit. And with me today, it's Friday, and I have Mr. Jim Welsh from Macro Tights. He's joining us to break down like this, this crazy week that we had. I, I mean, what, what a wild week. And Jim, welcome. Yeah. Well, it's always good to join you, and nothing better than at the end of a crazy week. I mean, let's talk crazy. So, how crazy was it that 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 the Fed chair was as dovish as he was? I mean, that took it obviously took the market off guard because of the outsized move that we saw in stocks, everything in the dollar, yeah. gold, you name it. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, a lot. The common theme that I heard amongst traders was, "Well, I expected us to get here, but not so fast." You know that that was like one of those. Of course, that, that's 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 how it all fell out. So, why did we get such a dovish dove, dovish Jerome Powell? Uh, tell okay. us about it. Well, um, a couple of things. Just in this past Monday's weekly technical review, I looked for the unemployment rate to remain unchanged the headline and core PCE to be downgraded a little bit, they were. And I also thought that the projection for the Fed funds rate would go from 5.1 to 4.9. And instead, what we saw is 4.6. And I think one has to understand the dynamics of the FOMC meetings. One of the things that Powell attempts to do, uh, and sometimes it's a lot easier uh, to do than others, is to craft a consensus so there's a united front, and lo and behold, what do you get? Unanimous votes. And over the last 18 months, we've seen really a string of consistent unanimous votes. And in part, the path was somewhat obvious. The Fed had to ratchet rates up because they were behind the curve, slowly uh, you know, uh, uh, go from 75 to 50 to 25, then start spacing it out because they knew the lag effects. So to me, it was easy for him and that in the environment we've been in to kind of keep everything together. Now what we see is because inflation has come down, there is a number of members of the FOMC who think that the Fed should be cutting rates sooner rather than later. Now, on December 1st, Powell gave a speech. He said it would be pre premature to think that we've confidently hit the restrictive rate or discuss rate cuts and we're ready to raise rates. So to me, what that, on my interpretation is, Powell didn't change that much, but the summary of economic projections showing the funds rate going from 5.1 to 4.6 kind of left him no choice but to kind of say, okay, here's what's happening. And I don't believe he shares that level of dovishness but at this point in time, he, you know, with, with the numbers that were going to get released, he wasn't going to go out there and contradict, if you will, that message. You know, it's um, so in, in other words, you're just saying he really wussed out. I mean, uh, well, you can call it that at the same time, you know, he's working with a bunch of people and he's attempting to reflect a consensus view. Yeah. And in this case, the consensus, if you look at the dots, you know, for many money meetings, the dots have been like real narrow in terms of the spread between high and low. Well, this time they're like this, okay? And and I think Goolsby's down at about three and seven eighths and a few other people I could guess in terms of where they're at. Um, there were eight people that are at four and seven eighths and higher. So what this sets up in my view, if this analysis is halfway right, is in coming meetings, there's going to be a pretty serious debate between those who uh, will push against the idea of cutting rates aggressively uh, and maybe even as soon as, you know, at the March meeting. Because right now, the the uh, probabilities are that they're not just cutting in March, they're cutting in March, May, and June. And it, the probabilities are like north of 90%. So we have this rush to consensus that, oh, this means that Fed is on board with cutting rates and inflation is going to allow it to happen. And um, I just don't agree with that analysis. Well, so that leaves us to uh, in a situation, Jim, where, you know, we've got obviously going into the end of the year. It's not a lot stopping the markets, right? There's there, nope. there, there isn't anything that really gets in the way. The risk is as we get into the beginning of the year, if the data really starts to weaken, it could really shatter the confidence of the market, believing that there's going to be a rate cut 
um, you know, in the spring? Well, actually, I think it's going to potentially be the opposite. As I discussed in the December macro ties, uh, if you look at what happened in January of last year, Blake, retail sales were really strong. And what we know is more and more people are using gift cards as their Christmas or, or holiday present. Uh, and it makes sense because then, you know, you, you hey, you, you love this store. I got you a gift card at that store. You can pick out exactly what you want. And so I think it's like 60 percent of the people incorporate either for themselves or for as a gift gift cards. Well, what we saw last year is retail sales were very strong in January. And I think it's a combination. You have sales going on, you know, retailers trying to get rid of stuff and being using the gift cards to take advantage of that. I think we're likely to see the same thing happen. In other words, the economy is going to continue to show decent strength as we get into early next year. Things like unemployment claims. I thought they would be moving more aggressively up. They haven't. Retail sales continue to hold up. You know, job growth is softened, but it's still really pretty decent. So I just think that, you know, what could unrail this more than anything else is that the economy gets into early next year and it still looks like on a solid footing. And I think that undermines people thinking, whoa, wait a second, the Fed maybe won't be able to be as aggressive. In addition, you're going to have speeches. And we saw one already today. John Williams came out and said, hey, you know, I'm not really talking about rate cuts. So I think that that divide between the people on the FOMC, those who are backing, you know, uh, rate cuts sooner and more frequent versus those who are still in the camp of I'm waiting and seeing. We're going to see that play out in speeches in coming weeks, uh, which will create some tension for the markets as well. Well, Jim, before we get into your charts, um, we before we get into your charts and 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 go through everything that you brought for us today, um, I, I, I want to ask you this. It, it sounds like that you are in the camp, and remember, we talk every week. So, folks, if you if yep. you enjoy these conversations every week, make sure you you know give Jim a big thumbs up. You know, subscribe to this channel, hit the bell icon so you get a you get a notification every time this this uh, this this conversation happens every week. Um, and then you can watch it, you know, as soon as it, as soon as it's released, yeah. but Jim, um, it sounds like, cause you, you've been in the, you know, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, a, a hard landing, you know, sometime in 2024 sounds like to me that you feel less likely that's going to happen. No, <laughs> ironically, no, I just, okay. that, you know, in other words, the impact from a uh, higher interest rates, tighter lending standards, the inverted yield curve, uh, access to money for small businesses being restrained significantly. All of that is still coming down, I believe. I might be wrong, but I think that's still happening. But in the short run, one has to acknowledge that, all right, I, one of the things I wanted to see, as I said, uh, unemployment claims start to really ramp up. The continuing claims, they have increased a little bit, Blake, but not as much as I would have expected. Um, so, the indications that uh, a slowing was more imminent just aren't really appearing in the degree that would say, yep, right around the corner. So, and, and when I wrote the December uh, macro tides and put it out um, last week, you know, I, I looked at what happened in January of last year and it's like, why won't that happen again in terms of retail sales continue to hold up? So I just think that in the short run, uh, you know, Wall Street has moved to, oh, man, they're going to be able to cut like crazy. And I think if the economy shows a little bit more resilience, which seems likely uh, in the first part of next year, that'll have to get dialed back a little bit. But I still believe we're going to see a significant slowing in, in the economy with at least one negative quarter of GDP next year. So it's kind of like, I think, the head fake. Um, and, um, you know, what that implies for markets, as you said, there's no reason to sell. I mean, that's really where we're at right now in most markets, because markets believe the Fed's going to take this dovish uh, path. Um, so to me, that implies that we're going to see some of the trends that emerged, you know, on Wednesday after the meeting are going to persist for a while. And, you know, we'll get into some of the charts and get into more detail. But uh, no, I don't think uh, what happened on Wednesday in any way negates 
uh, what's still coming for the economy. I mean, let's think about it. Short-term rates haven't really moved in terms of the prime rate, which is tied to the Fed funds rate. So people can talk about cuts. We haven't gotten one yet, have we? No, which means auto loan rates, credit card rates, they're all still the same. Um, mortgage rates, yes, definitely. They, they have come down from near eight to maybe a touch below 7%. That's helpful. Um, but the overall thrust of the tightening of monetary policy and uh, lending standards, Blake, has not been reversed. That's the reality. All right. Well, let's let's uh, let's do this and let's take a look at some of your charts that you brought. Uh, and I'll, we'll start off with the first one, which let me get over to it. Uh, here we go. Um, so what are you showing the difference here between 2021 and 2023? I mean, what, okay. what, are, what are we looking at? This is me poking a little fun, both at the Fed and also Wall Street uh, and a lot of people who put a tremendous amount of weight on the summary of economic projections, that's SEP. And so in 2021, go down to the very bottom. So this was December of 2021 meeting. And look at what the Fed said the funds rate was gonna be at the end of 2022, 0.9. So it was 0.1 and they were penciling in three, three rate increases. What did it actually wind up being? 4.1. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Right. Um, so my point is people take some of this stuff as gospel. They really shouldn't. Uh, I think all the members of the FOMC are very earnest. They're doing their very, very best. But if they could be that wrong at that point in time, I don't think any of us should, you know, in a sense, assume that, oh, this means we're going to get all those cuts. I don't think it means that at all. And that's all I'm trying to say here is that four, six, for a number of reasons, uh, especially early next year, may there may be some you know doubt cast upon how quickly uh, the Fed's going to uh, you know cut if indeed the economy continues to show decent momentum in the first part of next year. I think that's likely, you know, so. Anyway. All right. Well, OK, that that's uh, that uh, definitely they were wrong. I mean, you're pointing out that they were dead wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, with the no, Fed Fund futures, the Fed Fund futures in January or December of 21, we're looking for three rate increases. Gee, does Wall Street depend on the Fed? You know, anyway. So right. this is a chart overlaying the current level uh, and path of inflation uh, compared to the 1970s. In fact, 1972 to 84 is the black line. And we had a big spike into uh, 73, 74, and then a dip as the economy went into a recession, and then obviously another move up. And so I've been talking about how I don't think the Fed is going to cut rates aggressively next year because of uh, tight capacity utilization. That number came out today, 78.8. 70 I think it's likely to have to come down near 76. The unemployment rate's at 3.7. We need to see more slack. So my point is, if indeed the Fed eases prematurely, we're likely to see inflation tick up uh, later on, some point in time next year. All right. I'm not saying it's going back to you know a higher high. In other words, above 9% on the CPI. But again, in terms of pushback against this consensus in the early part of the, you know, like, oh my God, the Fed's going to be cutting rates. Well, what might go wrong? And to me, uh, there's a number of reasons why I think inflation is not going to just continue to work its way down as uh, aggressively as it has over the last 12 months. And again, that just pushes back against the idea of the Fed cutting in March, May, and June. And to me, that leads to a correction in, in uh, the markets as, as we get into January and February. That makes Nothing sense. Nothing major at that point. But okay. anyway, I just this parallel is worth paying attention to. And again, as always, it's nice. It's cute to see these kinds of things. But you yeah. need other things to kind of support it. Well, one one of the other things, Jim, I, I wanted to ask is, and this is uh, basically inflation at the CPI level. So, are you going to be focused directly on the CPI prints, or are there other inputs that you're going to be looking at? Well, the the core CPI is way more important than headline. 
Um, and then the Fed pays much more attention to the core PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index. Um, and so that really should be people's focus because that's where the Fed's attention on. But you know, on Wall Street, Main Street, people look at the headline CPI. Why? Well, when they go fill up their gas tank, you know, gas prices going up or down. What's happening with food prices? So those are in the headline. They're not in the core CPI. Yeah. So, um, no, again, I, I just think I, I'm just I disagree with the idea that the Fed's going to be that aggressive. And when I look at the layout of the dots and so forth and where I think Chair Powell really is, um, I just think that people have jumped to a conclusion that is assuming the Fed doing way too much or doing more than I think is likely. Okay, well, let's take a look at your next chart, which is the, um, it looks like wages, a wages chart. So yeah. what what do, what is this telling us? And let me get rid of okay. my drawing here. NFIB is the National Federa Federation of Independent Businesses. Basically, it's a monthly survey of small businesses. They employ half the people in the country. So this is an overlay between what percentage of the respondents uh, are looking to increase wages minus the percent that aren't, all right? So you got 30%. Well, we can see that in the last 20 years, this is one of the highest levels. So it's been ticking up the last two, three years. The blue line is the Atlanta Fed wage tracker, which that axis is over on the left-hand side, and it's around 5%. So, you know, these, have, these two data series have had a decent correlation. So to me, this is something, the NFIB number is something to pay attention to when it comes out every month to see how sticky that is, because in the past, when uh, more small businesses have planned to increase wages, guess what? The Atlanta Fed uh, tracker, wage tracker, starts to follow suit. So again, what this suggests is wages are going to gradually, I think year over year, just because it's a 12 month rate of change, ease a little bit. But the degree of easing, I think, is going to really slow materially. And what the Fed needs to see is wage growth under 4%, ideally down around 3 to 3.5, three uh, because that's the level that's consistent with something close to 2% inflation. Right now, the Atlanta Fed is at 5%. And so, again, when inflation was really low from 2009 uh, really to about 2016, you can see on the left-hand side, the Atlanta Fed was up less than three, three and a half percent. We're still way above it. So the stickiness of wage inflation ties into what I've been talking about in terms of labor market tightness, which by the way, Powell did cite <laughs> on Wednesday, uh, you know, labor market tightness is easy, but it's still too tight. I mean, he said a lot of the things he's been saying for months is just everyone ignored that. Just yeah. Look at what the, what the SCP at 4.6 was saying, all right? Literally, he said everything he has said for months and two weeks ago on December 1st when he spoke at this Bellman College. So anyway. Um, yeah. And, and um, OK, well, the next chart, Jim, you, you brought is crude oil. And, you know, crude, it's like one of those seems like one of those, uh, you know, gimmies that, uh, you know, thanks to the thanks to the Fed, we should see a nice rally here in crude. And it's one of the things that's probably going to keep inflation expectations fairly high, right? Yeah. I mean, again, the CPI drops significantly because of the gigantic declining gas prices and obviously oil prices in the month of November. Um, and, um, you know, that has fed, if you will, the disinflation psychology. Uh, again, I'm looking at this thing five waves down. That says we're getting a bounce. How big of a bounce? Well, I think that horizontal trend line, which is up around 79 bucks, kind of says, okay, 78, give or take a little bit. Um, I mean, it's not a gigantic move. Obviously, it could be bigger than that. Um, you know, it oil dropped about $25. So we're talking about maybe a 50% retracement getting up to that level, which is in the ballpark. My only point is, if we get into next year and the economic data continues to be you know, chugging along at that 2% plus range. Uh, we don't see wage growth uh, ameliorating 
uh, quickly and all of a sudden energy prices tick up a little bit, it calls into question the aggressiveness of uh, the rate cuts that Wall Street's expecting. I just think that's a likely scenario that will lead to the first correction next year. In the short run, the narr narrative is going to dominate that you know that you pointed out earlier. All right. Uh, well, let's uh, let's <laughs> let's see what happens. Um, yeah. All right. This is your S and P chart. How how do you, how yeah. are you seeing the market? Because we have rallied substantially, and it looks like we're going to continue. Yeah. Um, you know, it, you know, straightforward. Uh, I think in our call, talk last week, in my letter on Monday, I thought we'd see a pullback to forty four twenty one. Because I expected Powell to push back. I thought they'd lower the the right. SEP from five one to four nine, but I thought he'd push back. And the way things evolved, he really I mean, again, he said everything he said before, but with the the SCP at four six, no one paid any attention to it. So um in the Monday's letter, I said, okay, after we get this pullback, I think we're going to all time highs. Uh given what we saw in the shift that the markets perceive on Wednesday. You know, one potential target is up around 5,200, where you had an A wave up to 4,607, the pullback to 4,104, there's some kind of a B wave, and then we get this C wave, the two legs are equal at 5,200. At a minimum, I think that going into January, the net narrative is going to be so dominant that we'll see the S&P make a new all-time high above 4,818. Um, now, at the bottom panel is a measure of breath strength. And you can see it's really overbought. And, and normally you say, well, wow, it's really overbought. You have to get a pullback. Yeah, there may be a pullback. But if, if people think no recession, Fed's cutting rates, earnings going up, why would anybody sell? Now, what we're seeing a little bit is sell the mega cap to buy the stuff that's beaten down. And by yeah. the way, energy stocks would fall into that category. So to me, what this implies given the seasonality and everything else that the market, I think is going to work its way higher into January. I think if I'm right about some of the data, not supporting the aggressive rate cuts, we'll get uh, in the first quarter, a modest pullback, you know, is it three to 5%? And then I think the market will try up again. And then by, as we get closer to the second quarter, that's when I think, the data is going to start to turn south and softer. And that's when I think the market will be more vulnerable. So, you know, as I, I've used this analogy, we all watch murder mysteries and all of a sudden the evidence, you know, kind of points to a different suspect. Yeah. And so we have, to, you know, I have to acknowledge that, all right, I was surprised that the SCP did what it did, but I also have to respect what that did to coalesce the bullishness on Wall Street. And yeah, the the, uh, the the sentiment numbers are going to be crazy. Why? Because everybody understands the narrative and it's bullish. But high sentiment alone doesn't cause market declines. So for me, we're in the first quarter, we're going to have to see this momentum that, uh, you know, has, you know, exhibited great strength begin to soften. And if you look off to the left-hand side of the chart, uh, like going into the July high. This oscillator will start to uh, weaken prior to a high in price. Did the same thing back in January and February of this year. So right now, the narrative is very positive. There really are no reasons to sell. And that keeps selling pressure at bay, which suggests over the next few weeks, uh, any pullbacks are likely to be in the, the garden variety of Oh my God, the market's down 1.2%. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah. It's just well, not going to pull back. Last week, the number that's seared in my head with you is 4,900. And I was like, really? 4,900? And it yeah. sure does seem like, well, we're, I mean, we're, we're, we're less than 100 points away from all time highs now. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, again, I was surprised by the SCP. All right. Uh, it removed any chance that Powell could really push back. So it's kind of like, okay, things change. Does it change? And, and as a, I sent out a special report yesterday morning, kind of covering some of this stuff. Does it change the bigger picture in terms of there's still a market slowdown coming in the economy? I don't think so. You know, but 
as we get into the first quarter and later in the first quarter, we're going to have to really see more signs of it yeah. uh, showing up. And we're going to have to see this momentum uh, begin to weaken before we're likely to see any kind of meaningful uh, pullback in, in the S&P. Well, I, I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts here, Jim, on the bond market, because the the bond market's moving like um, like it's a, a crypto based or <laughs> tethered, tethered to hip crypto, yep. crypto to Bitcoin or something. It, yeah. th- these are some very big moves in the bond market. Gigantic, gigantic. Um, now, uh, I nailed the high in Treasury yields in late October. Uh, October 23rd, I said it's time to buy. I think Treasury yields are going down. I still think, and I said it back then, I think the 10-year gets under 340 uh, at some point in time in the first half of next year. Uh, I thought we were near an inflection point last week when we spoke, you know, that, okay, we're going to see yields uptick. Again, that that SEP blew that out of the water. What we've seen is what I would call an extended decline, where, you know, normally they're one, two, three, four, five. Well, what happens in big moves, persistent moves, you get a one, two, and then a one, two, three, four, five for three, and then a four, five. And so I think that's what we've seen. It looks very much like a completed pattern. I mean, I didn't put a little, the, the one, two, three, four, five in for wave three. Um, but, you know, if I did, you'd see nine moves down, right? Okay. Right, right here. I still believe that the expectation of those aggressive rate cuts, there's, I think things are going to get pushed back against that. So I think at some point in time in the first quarter, we'll see the 10-year get up to the 420, 430. It could go a little bit higher. Um, but if I'm right, then about the economy uh, indeed showing more slowing than people are expecting, uh, that's why I think the 10-year can get down to under 340. So we've seen 110 basis point effectively decline in the 10-year. So yeah. if it got up, you know, 430 maybe in a touch higher and you get an equal wave down when it looks like the economy is slowing well that's easily how you get under 440 that's what i think is is coming wow no, i mean that would... it's time i think and again i was wrong a week ago i was like hey we're about to see a pullback um it was predicated on something that didn't happen uh in a sense to me there's more justification for people to take some chips off the table if you've been long bonds, um, because I think we're going to see a retracement rally that will provide another entry to get the next leg down in treasury yields that I think will culminate sometime in the middle of next year. Um, again, all predicated on it, the economy is going to do a head fake, um, a little stronger in the first part of the year, and then I think it begins to slow. We well, Jim, uh, for, for some of the Eagle Eye viewers out there, they may see this, but in the 10-year bond market, uh, in the ZNs, yeah, you actually have this head and shoulder pattern that just completed mm. this week. So, yeah. Oh, that's this, another justification of saying, you know what? Yeah. And it's really, really, I mean, yield-wise is extraordinarily oversold. Obviously, bond prices is extraordinarily overbought. So all you need is an excuse and again, I, I think it's not going to happen between now and the end of the year in all likelihood. It's going to yeah. wait for a new set of data coming out um, in the first part of next year. And again, things like retail sales for January won't come out until probably February 10th or 12th. So that to me is, you know, that the market can work its way higher, probably hold stocks, uh, hold at a high level. Bond's not doing a whole lot. And then if we get data that says, wait, things aren't slowing down much, it, you know, that doesn't jive with aggressive rate hikes starting in March, that provides the, the reason for maybe some more serious, if you will, profit taking in both stocks and bonds. Well, I, well, you know, what does that mean for the dollar? Because the dollar has been beaten down pretty hard. And and I and I do have to mention, we do have PCE next Friday, guys. So yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So which I think, you know, from what I've heard, you know, I haven't looked at the numbers yet. I haven't had time, but, you know, again, is it going to come down? Yeah, I think it's going to come down, uh, uh, but not as rapidly as we've seen. All right. So dollar last week, I thought, OK, we're getting a bounce. We're going to work our way up towards 105. Obviously, the SEP completely derailed that. Um, but again, it looks to me more like, hey, you got five waves down here. 
very, very clearly. What that implies is we're going to get a bounce. I think 104 to 104.50-ish, something like that is coming. Um, you know, going into early next year, again, if the data comes in and hasn't really softened, that'll push back against the dovishness that people now think is coming from the Fed. Um, ultimately, I think the dollar, and you know, this is even before last week, I've been saying the dollar is dropping to under 100 next year when the economy sh shows signs of softening. I still think that's coming, Blake. Um, and well, the, the we, rate that make... the rate that it's dropping, we could do that next week. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible. No, it's possible. Um, yeah. No, I mean, again, I, I just think that, um, uh, you know, either my supposition that the delayed effect of rate increases, lending standards being tightened aggressively, all that stuff, I think is going to have a material, material effect on growth. To the point where people, whoa, wait a second, things are slowing more than we expected. You know, um, I think that'll wind up being a negative for the equity market, great for bonds, also a negative for the dollar. All right. Well, um, the last chart you brought, Jim, and let me let me grab it really quick. It is the gold chart. Now, gold's interesting because I, I mean. I it, I heard unanimously uh, across the, from everybody. Oh wow, we got this bounce, but we got here a lot faster than we thought we were going to get. Yeah. But gold still, you know, well below its previous triple top, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the to me the pattern here is still open. Uh, I'm giving the benefit of the doubt to the upside because of the perception that people have. Now, uh, if the dollar does indeed bounce early next year, we'll see what challenge that poses for the dollar. I can put two different counts up there, one positive, one negative. So to me, it's just near term. It's like, all right, will the perception of what the Fed is going to do be more supportive going into the first part of next year for gold, hence a move above the 2122 level? I I'm, you know, modestly leaning in that favor at the same time. You know, it, I can't rule out that we're not going to drop below 1974 and obviously go deeper than that. But near term, I just think um, it's more positive than negative in terms of the market's perception of the Fed's dovishness uh, and that we'll see gold work its way higher. I, I, irrespective of all the near terms, I think next year, if I'm right about the economy slowing, the Fed actually having to cut rates, not because inflation is down, but because we've got weakness in the economy. I think that's pretty, and the dollar dropping below 100. Uh, I got to believe the gold is, and I continue to believe gold will make a move towards 2300. So the near term path to me is uh, more of a challenge. It's a little jumbled, but, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but the little bigger picture, I think, is still pretty clear in terms of gold ultimately making a move towards 2300 next year. All right. Well, 1974 is going to be the level that uh, I think traders are going to have written down in their journals. Um, Jim, it has been a crazy week. And thank you so much for helping us guide or uh, guiding us through the markets every week. If you guys and gals are enjoying what you see here with Jim, make sure you give him a thumbs up. Uh, Jim, I, I look forward to our conversation I guess we're going to be doing it next week. Um, Why not, man? Yeah, I mean, hey, you know. Just in case I wore this shirt, you know, with the red, kind of like, you know, the Christmas thing. Because uh, I wasn't sure if we'd be doing it next Friday. So I better better get it in. Right? Maybe next next week we're going yeah. to both wear it next week too. Santa caps. How about that? Uh, I don't have one. Well, I kind of have a Santa but Just put on really. a beard. We can pretend. <laughs> that would be good. So, all right. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll catch you next Friday, big guy. All right. Thanks, Jim. It's great. Great. And and by the way, make sure you guys check out Macro Tides and uh, let Jim know that you, you you saw him here. What's the email, Jim? Macro. Oh, Jim Welsh Macro Gmail. I'll send you the December Macro Tides issue, which I think is good stuff. Uh, yeah. I felt pretty good about it. You know, some months I feel like, wow, that actually was a pretty good letter. So yeah, I, I think you send out some pretty good, uh, pretty good stuff. And I love getting your updates when you when you have them. So uh, make sure you all take advantage of that. And uh, Jim, I want to say have a great weekend. You do the same. All right. Hey, traders, Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, 
share, and subscribe to our channel. Also click the bell notification so you do not miss any of our market-related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.